This is that one audition with Alicia Oxy. I'm very excited about this one. <laughs> so much of the audience has heard me say this several times, but when you get to know a person outside the industry, and then I, as the person who's hosting this, get to go and do a deep dive, I get so excited then to talk to my friend and be like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you did X, Y, and Z, or this happened and that happened. But I wanted to tell you this on mic in full disclosure. My first manager in 2004, I was up for a couple of different indies. Don't ask me what they were. I do not remember. And she sat me down one day and she was like, listen, they all want Carly Pope. So if you could be like, go watch her stuff. And if you could just try to be more like that. But you were you were like the it girl of all indies, of all everything in early <laughs> 2000s. And I will never forget that conversation where she was like, just they all want Carly Pope. It was like this like praying thing. If you could go be more like that. And I was like, sure. But isn't that not... Yeah. Okay. Let me go do some research. I'll be right back on my Carly Pope in person. Oh my God. That is such an insane concept. And, and also where are these people now? Can we find them? And can we ask them if they're sick? We knock on their door and see right. if they're all It's just so funny to hear something like that. First of all, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. You are such, you are such a delight and what you do for people in this industry at so many various levels of their career I mean, truly, at the, from entry level to 1%, you've got people covered. You've got such engaged conversations. You have so many insights and you're so quick with your curiosity. And it's just, it's really, a, it's really, really a gift that you're giving to us. And I just, I really appreciate listening to your show, but I also appreciate that you had any interest in bringing me on it. So thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. But also must be like Carly Pope. <laughs> well, I mean, don't, uh, all I can I'm going to emulate this. Don't, <laughs> don't you dare do what I do because you'll find yourself in various places you don't care to be. But that's, it's just like, that is, that is such, it, it, it truly is such a bananas anecdote to me because the way I was feeling in 2004 is that's not sad. at all, was not at all top of my game. You know, not at all like the person that that people wanted in the Indies, not at all the person that had a plethora of opportunity or work to, you know, there were in in 2004, I was. I had moved back to Canada. Mm -hmm. I had dropped my agency, which was William Morris down here in America. I had actually in 2004. Or might have been, it was either 2004 or 2005 that I ended up getting a manager down here again. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was 2004. Maybe it was 2004. Could have even been 2003 now that I'm thinking about it. But for, for I left America, went back up to Canada as soon as I quote could, but I moved out. Like I, I, I moved out of my apartment and I moved back officially at the beginning of 2002. And then probably maybe 2000, end of 2003, 2004, I got a manager down here who I'm still with today and I adore, Ben Levine. And, but I was in Canada what doing the, things. Yeah, what was the impetus to move back? So to catch the audience up, that yeah. you were on a hit show, you know, 98, 99, in the 90s <laughs> i mean well and i was curious if that show brought you down and then when i do you know when we do a deep dive on imdb what we know today it's all retrospect right you had uh, done a, an indie film that mike white now everybody knows who mike white is you yeah. know like the the show that you did was it created with it was a co-creation was it ryan murphy and somebody else Ryan Murphy and Gina Matthews co-created Popular, yes. and and then and then Gina left after the pilot in terms of in terms of creative capacity. She left the show, so she did not continue with us. But she was she was the co-creator of the show, and she became a very dear friend of mine and sort of like a surrogate parent to me when I because I had we shot the pilot when I was eighteen, and I was just about to turn nineteen when we started shooting the first season. So that was in nineteen ninety nine. 
and then we we went into we rolled into season two and after season two i sort of um had i really really kind of a crisis of self i i really didn't know who i was i didn't know what i wanted to do i felt very pulled in so many directions we didn't yet know if the show was going to go again but I, I, I mean, truly, it was probably like, okay, cut, that's a wrap on season two. And I was already like wheeled up in an airplane up to Vancouver. Wow. And it, I mean, I was like desperate to get home. And really, I think what that was, was for me, I, I, was, I was desperate to figure out the experience that I had just had two years of, which was, by all intents and purposes, anyone's dream gig That's what I was going to say yeah Anyone's dream gig and for me it was my dream gig when I was working when I was doing the work I was so happy and everything else that came with the work being on the WB which was a very time. yeah it was you know you know you know you remember what it was it was like really churning out celebrity and young celebrity and mm -hmm. it was a very uncomfortable place for me to be because I I didn't feel like I had set my sights in like a strategic way to move to Los Angeles, to be an actress, to be on a hit show. Like I didn't have those, I hadn't created those like markers in my, my own mind. And as a result, I was in this situation, which was incredible but I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't know how to handle it. I, I, it was, I was desperately confused because I just felt like I was in someone else's body. I felt like, you know, those mini wheats commercials where it was yes. like a yeah. child would be dressed up in their mother's pearls or whatever it was. And it was, it, it was this out of body experience for me. That's what I felt like. I felt like I was a fraud. Well, I mean, truly, I, I was felt so like curious because, you know, Right before Popular, you maybe did a half a dozen shows, like as a guest star or this yeah. little bit here, a little bit there. Yeah. And then, yeah, you jump on a freight train that I feel like nobody. And I think even as an, even later in your career for certain people too, that first show that people get, nobody understands. You're always pining for, oh, when I get that series regular or when I get this hit show, people think, right? They yeah. have an idea of what what that's going to solve for them. They're going to become more relevant. They're going to get more opportunities. They're going to have money. They're going to be yep. able to sustain. So that I would think is something that with maturity that some people kind of put that pressure on that series regular. Like you sure. said, that wasn't your marker when you came to LA or when you started, what was the marker or what were you thinking yeah. that you wanted to do? It's a great question. And and on that note, it would be very ignorant and misleading of me to say that I wasn't, it's not like I was plucked out of nowhere. I'd never, <laughs> I'd no, never, at all. Yeah. Or I had no idea what was going, it wasn't, I, I, I cannot mislead in that way. Of course I was auditioning. Of course I had a desire to pursue this art form that I was only very, very greenly involved in, but I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the process. I was I was eager to to experience what not only what the theater world felt like, which which I had the opportunity in high school to be a part of an incredible theater company at my high school, which was like a renowned program in Vancouver. It was sort of one of its kind at the time. Now there are more of those things. And it's actually a proper mini art school now, which is something that it wasn't at the time. But it was still a very, you know, it was a. It was, it was a, um, it prepared you. For it was, it prepared me for something. It prepared me to enjoy it, to know that I loved the craft of acting. Yes. And, um, and as a result of one of the plays that we did, uh, which was the female version of Neil Simon's, the odd couple, we, <laughs> my, my agent to this day in Vancouver, in Canada, he came to that show and he asked my teachers after the show if I would be interested in any, having representation and I remember them sort of pulling me aside and I was so my initial response like how how 
crazy is it how self-deprecating, but also maybe telling too that where I was at emotional, like mature in my, in terms of my emotional maturity, but my uh, initial response was I was embarrassed that he chose me because I felt bad for everybody else. Like I felt bad. I felt you have the sweetest heart. And I know no, I, I, this is not for, yeah, no, I know, but just your empathy. But it was, others. I think that that, uh, why I bring that up is because that sense is something that I took with me for so long. And it's still something that I have with me. And that's part of why I said I was a fraud is because I think I constantly had this sense of why me though? Why me? Why not somebody else? Like they want it more or they, they're harder worker. They're a harder worker than I am or, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. And so I, I, I felt really grateful that, that he singled me out. I felt very interested in meeting with him to understand what that could look like. Mm -hmm. It felt very, it felt professional in the sense that here was somebody who has a business and he's seen something in me that he wants to collaborate on. So it felt professional and I, I was intrigued by that. And I remember, I remember going to his office to meet with him and he gave me some sides, you know, it's probably from like 21 Jump Street or like something that was shooting at like Breaker High or like something that was like, like he would have, he would have been, you know, giving me something at the time. And he gave me these sides that was not theater, that was film and TV. And I remember doing like a cold audition with them. And his response was, and he's a very candid person. He was just sort of like, yeah, okay, we could work with that. It's a bit big, but like we can work. <laughs> we can always bring big down. <laughs> we can, yes. we can uh, focus you in. So it was it was funny, but I just I really appreciated his candor, and he and, he, and that's why I'm still with him. However many years now, twenty six years or something later, wow. twenty seven well, later. So then you started in the Vancouver market. Was popular? Like obviously, was it a what brought you to LA? Did something bring you yeah. before popular? Yes. So this is so one of those one of those handful of jobs that you rec that you uh, referenced that I had been a part of prior to prop popular. One of them was a film called Disturbing Behavior that yes, the very great David Nutter directed, mm -hmm. and David Nutter had brought me. In I I had gone in for the first audition for one character that I think was the character that opens the movie, which is like she's giving a blowjob or something in the car, and it was a very it's very you know the whole movie was like kids doing bad things, right? That's like Hence that's disturbing behavior. Yeah, yeah my brother in law's in it. That so many people are in yes. that movie. Yes. yes, yes, of course, and that's how I know your brother in law, and yes. that's how and that's how he and I both know David Nutter. Yeah. And and David Nutter is instrumental and I'll get there because both AJ and I had this same experience, which I will explain in a second. But it was so I had gone in for this audition and then David wanted to see me for other roles. So I went in for like a few different roles in the piece. And ultimately, he gave me this this role of Abby in the movie to play Ethan Embry's girlfriend, but it's only seen in like video flashback sequences. And ultimately it didn't make the theatrical cut of the movie because it was deemed too violent because we commit suicide on, on video camera in, in the movie. And, and, you know, they wow. wanted to be writing the way it was. So it was on a director's cut somewhere, you know, but it never made the theatrical cut of the movie. Anyway, David Nutter was such a love, such a wonderful human. He was so, he was so, he, he was so amazingly interested in the actors in Vancouver. I think, I don't, I don't know. I still don't know what, like maybe it was just that era of performer, or maybe it was just that it was, it, we were different. We maybe, or maybe it's just that he felt like he was making his film and he had really, really committed people that were nice and kind and would show up and do their work. And, you know, I don't know, but he, he then went on to direct the pilot of Roswell for the WB. Yes. Which was the same cycle year as popular. So David Nutter 
came up to Vancouver to do a specific casting session for Roswell because he loved his experience up there a year to probably two years prior, maybe a year. I think it was 1996, maybe that we did disturbing behavior. So two years prior, he had had this experience. He said, I want to go back up there. I want to see, I want to see like the crew that made, you know, made Mm -hmm. my movie sing and whatever. So he did, he came up and also it was a way of him to give back, which was so incredibly beautiful of him. But he came up to audition Vancouver actors and he brought so many of us down from that session, AJ, Brendan Fair. Um, I'm I'm looking at the cast list right now. No, there's, a, there's, a, there's a girl that I, I can't remember her name right now. And, and um, sadly, she's no longer with us. But Michelle, oh, just forgetting Michelle her last name. Michelle Skelnick? Skelnick, Skelnick, yeah. And there were, but there were a number of us that he brought down. I think he brought down like six of us, six or seven of us to test which was such an unbelievable experience. And and that was your first test then? It was my first test. It was my first trip to LA without my family when we were, you know, coming through to go to Disneyland or going to Palm Springs as a child. Like it was my first time, you know, coming down. And he he brought us all down and we here we are like little Canadian camp that was staying down the street of Fox in these hotels to test. And it was such a wild experience. I remember we all went to Jamba Juice one day because like that was, the, you know, now it's like so, so funny. To this go. is also testing. I mean, testing nowadays, it's like on a tape, maybe yeah. it's a Zoom, maybe you're lucky you go into that pressure situation, but testing back then, you had to do studio network. It's suits in the room. You're signing your contract. You're, you're signing, signing, yeah, your seven numbers years. Numbers that yep. you're going to see before. Do you feel like the being naive in that situation helped or did you get nervous at all? Because I feel like you like auditioning. Yes. Well, no, I don't. I don't. I, I am a, I'm a miserable auditioner. I'm a horrible auditioner. Horrible. Like... Mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm whispering as if like someone's going <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, to no, don't tell anybody, yeah. but the we're whole talking. world knows. <laughs> yeah. We're, like, we're on a podcast. You've got great circulation. I don't know why I'm whispering, but anyway, it's no, no auditioning is not a comfortable place for me. And so it's then- bizarre. It's, it's bizarre because that, that one, that one felt safe because they were like my friends from Vancouver. Like we were all coming down together. We, we were all in this together. We were all fish out of water. It felt very safe and comfortable. And then just to really quickly like wrap up how, how it got from A to B was I, I passed through from studio to network and then network said no, but they kept me in. So then I went to the next round and had to do it all over again. So this was like another time. I flew down again another time for but Roswell. They, for, for Roswell. They said no to you at network, but then they thought about you again a couple of weeks later. They're like, hold on, we're just going to wait a second and see. I, I, I don't know how this, I, I still feel like it was probably David Nutter that was like, I want, I don't know. I don't, because it doesn't make any sense. Logically knowing how the business works now, it doesn't make any sense. I'm pretty sure it was three rounds of that. Wow. No, three times over. And then finally it was like, guys, like, obviously we just like, this is not working. Like, let's move. It's got to move. We've got to move on. Like everyone has to move on. Every single person has to move on. Allison Jones has to stop bringing me and like the whole thing, just make it stop. So it was so bizarre. And then I remember I was in my first year of university at the time up in Vancouver and you know, I was, I was not exactly sure what I wanted to be doing. I thought it would be something in like the, you know, something in like the social sciences or counseling psychology, somewhere in that realm was where I was going to land. But I was just sort of toying around with classes and I was really enjoying being at school. I really wanted to be at school. And then this audition came up for popular. And I remember reading the script and going, this is unique. This is like different. This is like, there's a voice here for sure. But I was asked to audition for the role of Brooke, which is the popular girl. And interesting to see the show that way. Like you and Leslie switching. Okay. Okay. 
So they had asked me to audition for popular and I kind of went like, I don't. And again, it's this confidence thing, right? The thing that like I will work on my entire life is my sense of self-confidence. But I just didn't I was like, I just didn't buy myself for the role. But I I went with the opportunity that was in front of me, which was auditioning for that character. And then out of nowhere, I th- I feel like it wasn't a quick thing. I feel like it was like a couple weeks later. And we know how pilots yeah. used to work where it was all very fast. Everything happened pretty quickly. So when I didn't hear, I just thought, never mind. I'm going to go back to my like psychology 101 class and my theater history class and my, you know, yeah. my English class. And I'm going to enjoy the hell out of what I'm doing. And oh, I had this little part in a tiny TV movie that I was working on at the time too. So I was like, okay, this is good. This is good. I got my life up here. Everything's cool. Got the call that they wanted me to come down and test for popular. And I was sort of like, oh, but I've got, you know, I've got work on our guys and I've got my, I've got university to go to like, I don't know, that's kind of like inconvenient. Like it's kind of like not great timing and it's not, you know, and they're like, well, you have to go. So I, I went to the audition, Jennifer Craig, who is currently still my agent at Gersh, but she was at the time at William Morris Mm -hmm. asked Timon Stewart, who is my agent in Canada, if she could pick me up from the airport because she had contacted casting directors during pilot season and said, who, who, who do I need to know about? Who do I need to know about? And Alison Jones said, you should know about Carly Pope. Alison Jones was casting Roswell. So Jennifer Craig had said, can I pick her up from the airport? And I thought that was really strange also really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Also really unusual. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, like not- un- unusual on all sides, but I thought it was so I just immediately fell in love with her as a person because I just thought she it was it was it was kind-hearted but it was also very business forward and savvy and I just really appreciated who she was and who she proved to be. Anyway, she picked me up she took me to the audition. We had a little chat. I didn't think, I just was kind of like, oh, what a nice thing. She's doing me a favor kind of thing <laughs> at the right. time. You know? <laughs> and I went to the audition, testing for the role of Brooke against Leslie Bibb. You were against Leslie. That's who yeah, I was. It was the two of us, two mm-hmm. of us for the role of, of Brooke. And, you know, again, the way that, that these tests work, you do studio and then you like march over to network. And sometimes they're the same day and sometimes they're not. In this case, I believe that they were, but I don't know if I have that memory correct in my brain, but I think they might've been the same day. And I went in and they, they just were going that, you know, they were waiting a long time. Like after I went in, they were waiting a long time. And I was like, I've got to get back on set. Like I've got to get on my flight because we've got a night shoot tonight and I've got to get back there. And, and they came out and they said, Carly, can you come here for a second? And I think it was Ryan and Gina. I think the two of them came out of the room. And they said, would you ever consider reading for the role of Sam? But we're going to give you the material and you can take as much time as you want. And you can, you know, you can come back later in a couple of hours. Like we've got other people. And they were like, take as much time as you want. And I sort of like, look, and obviously I, I was familiar with who the character was, but of course I was not reading the script as that character ever. So it was but I was familiar enough that I just, I looked at the material and I just said, look, I, I don't have time to like, (laughs) (laughs) yes. So give me a second and then let's just do it. And so they, you know, they gave me a second. I took off my shoes. Like I went in barefoot. I threw my hair up into some kind of concoction on the top of my head. Like I just threw it up off my face and I went in there and I, cold red I love uh, and this is I know I'm really off track from your original no question. you're not this at is, all it's to kind of paint the picture of like it was so strange the way that I got myself to LA was very very strange but I I went in I cold read and then and then I was kind of like okay so you know let me know when I'm let me know when I'm released because I have to get on a plane 
because I was flying out that night to go to a night shoot. So, so I, you know, they, they released us because they were just reading. I mean, at that point they were, there were other people reading for the role of Sam, of course, and they still read those people, but they only had Leslie and I reading for the role of Brooke. So it was just this kind of like, you know, they moved on to the next role or whatever. I left, went to the airport, got on the plane. And I think by the time I got off the plane, they had said, we want to offer you the role of Sam. And, and I was sort of like, I don't understand what is going on. Yes. And, and I also felt so scared, yeah. like the amount of fear that I had in my body of what does that mean? Isn't that interesting? What does it mean now? Like, I don't know that I want, I don't know if I chose this. I know that I auditioned for it. I know I was a conscious human saying yes to the audition. Mm -hmm. I know that I got on that plane. I know that I walked in that room. I know that I walked out of that room. You know, I know that I know I made choices along the way, but it was so scary to me because I went, I, I what is, what's going to yeah. happen? What's going to happen now? Because I think that's the other thing too. When you sign a contract of that magnitude, especially at that age, any age, any age. I mean, AJ was in living in his car when he got his CSI New York contract. Right. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. so as an actor, we're thinking certain things or like you said, you're pretty focused on the work. You're not really thinking about everything else that comes with it in that space. So I can only imagine how do you feel about change? Like when I have change, even as much as I want it, that fear does creep in when it's like, oh, here we go. Something different is getting ready to happen. And I really want to stay contained in Vancouver, probably yeah. in my theater back at school. I can do this smaller project that I'm used to doing, but Absolutely. now you have a responsibility. You and Leslie are carrying the show. It's all yeah. on yeah. you. And that's, yeah. Sorry. Go on. Yeah. No, I, I, I haven't experienced that. So I don't, I can't even comprehend that pressure as well as excitement and, you yeah. know, excitement and anxiety kind of live in the same part of the brain. We know that, but well, we know that. exactly. Yeah. And that's, ex that's precisely it. It's sort of hard to gauge, especially when you're emotionally chronologically young still. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the other thing is I, I just, I just feel like I didn't have the I didn't have the emotional wherewithal or capacity to really grasp what was going to happen, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew, and, and to be perfectly honest, <laughs> I tried to figure out a way to turn it down. Did you really? Absolutely. Wow. Because I thought, wait a second, wait a second. They, but they wanted me for Brooke. So surely this is my out. If they now are asking me to, play Sam, that's our out. Like, let's just walk away. And I had very many people have conversations with me as they should have. And I'm so glad they did yeah. because uh, th I needed the pep talk. I needed also to be scared straight again, you know, <laughs> to sort yeah. of go through that and go, no, 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 no. You're going to do this and we'll figure out how to help you along the way. And we will, you know, devise the plans that will keep you feeling like, you're in control, but it all happened. It, it all happened very, very quickly. So that was probably like that test was either in like, I feel like it was maybe late January of, of 1998, 99, no, 99. It would have been 99. So January 99, we shot the pilot in February 99. And then we found out in May that we got picked up and we were shooting the series by July. Wow. So it was all very fast. It's, it's so fast. And then you're on that freight train and then everybody knows you in the landscape. The industry knows you. The world knows you. I really love in hindsight that you went back to safety. You went back to comfort. What, cause I always focus on this too, like recovery as an artist a lot mm -hmm. of times the recovery has to come through auditions because we're getting rejected all the time sure, yeah then yeah. there's recovery when something comes out and it's not received well i've yet to be able to explore recovery when something comes out and it actually does really well mm -hmm. what was what was your recovery to get back to you as an artist and like what 
did you decline auditioning at that time or did you go back to Vancouver and kind of get back into a smaller market? So I think, uh, yeah, I did. That's exactly, you're right on the nose with that. But, but basically I felt like the entire time we were shooting popular was for me, a process of me hiding and hiding and hiding and hiding and hiding. Cause I was scared. I was really, really scared and really uncomfortable. And I had, I had an incredible ally in Leslie Bibb, who was, who, who was not only more experienced, but she also had more, she, she had more professional acumen and strategy. So she understood the business better and she was able to sort of guide me and it didn't, and that didn't happen right away. She and I sort of like really fell into step with one another. I would say we were forced into step with one another, but we, we really genuinely fell into step with one another toward the end of the first season was when we kind of were like, Oh, you're my, you're my sis. Like, this is it. This is it. And, and we, you know, we very much appreciated and respected one another's craft and space and process and all the rest. And we all have different processes and it was, but it was truly like we fell into this kind of just strong bond. It was a strong bond that allowed me to feel safer when we were doing all the stuff outside of the walls of the studio I that the that press. allowed me to get mm. all the press and all that stuff that allowed me to sort of get through that side of it. But to get back to the point was I felt like I was just in this constant state of hiding from the industry. So for instance, with Orange County, the movie that yeah. you were earlier with Orange County, read the script, loved the script. They wanted me to read for Skylar Fisk's role mm -hmm. and which was the lead girl role. Lead and girl. I went, well, what about the Tanya role? Mm. Which is in two scenes of the film. Like, you know, I was like, curious about that. Yeah, you're answering all my questions that were in my head last night when I was doing this research. I was like, that's so interesting that after the hit show. But that's it was because I was hiding from everything. The you know, William Morris would send me these these like uh, blockbuster or bound to be blockbuster movies. And I would go, yeah, but what's happening in the indie world that's like probably never going to be seen, but might have a festival run and that could be cool, but also maybe it'll just never be seen. Like that was my mentality. And what this led me to understand is I was, I was, I had a major anxiety disorder and a lot of depression that I wasn't understanding and I wasn't dealing with and I wasn't coping with because I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't have the, I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the insight. I didn't have the guidance until I was able to kind of set that for myself. Ooh, I'm so glad you're talking about this because I feel like this career path lends itself to so many people having a nervous system that is in, it is highly affected. How can it not be? How can it not be? Well, and the thing is, is uh, truly, how could it not be at any age and phase at it? Yeah. Because there's a lot of, as you say, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of having to process that, like, how does that feel? And how do I get back on the horse after that? And where do I go from here? And how do I keep moving forward? And do, am I, do I even have a, do I even have an alley to move forward in anymore? Like what, what is the, yes. you know, what's the landscape? So there, there's a lot of stuff to process, but I think especially, at that age, I think I just, you know, I came from, and I want to choose my words carefully here, but I, I come from a very, very intertwined family. Yeah. <laughs> I love my family very much, but we're very intertwined. So leaving them was a, was a big wound for me. That was a big wound. And they were very worried also because I was so young. So it created some elements of, you know, I stress. Think, yeah. Stress. Absolutely. So, yeah. And that, and, and, you know, not to get too into like middle child syndrome, but I also felt a lot of my life was like making sure that everybody else was okay. So I had this responsibility to want to make sure everyone at home was okay. But then I had this massive responsibility that I was carrying a show all of a sudden at 18, 19 and that, and I didn't know how to negotiate those two things. And I didn't have the tools because I hadn't created a toolkit yet. And 
I didn't have the ability to understand how to manage all of that. And what it ended up doing was, was creating the sense or need to shut down. And disassociate. And disassociate. I'm, I'm so glad you're talking about this because people write in about this a whole hell of a lot where I'm so anxious at auditions that I like I can't do X, Y, and Z. I'm I'm I have a lot of anxiety. I've been away from the industry for 15 years and I want to come back and nobody cares. I think if our instrument's not quote unquote whole or sane or our thermostat's not neutralized. Yeah. How can we show up and do our best work? The audition process is not even set up for us to do great work. The actual system of the industry is not set up to care about the actors, the humans. We end yeah. up becoming this advertisement yeah. and then everybody thinks that it's that we're supported in those ways. And if you don't have the tools, many people that I feel like you, I end up talking to that have gotten that big win in the beginning at a younger age or land themselves on a show and have the responsibility. You don't know what to do with it the first time around. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing is, you know, you, you don't know what to do. I, I was trying to do my best with it, but really at the end of the day, when season two was finished, we didn't know if it was coming back from season three yet. We'd done 43 episodes of the show. Wow. Um, you know, we, I w I scooted right back up to Canada. And I think within that same week I booked a trip to, to well, my plan was to go to England first, then to go to Thailand, then to go to Malaysia, then to go back to Europe and do like some Europe and then come home and see w what was what. But I just needed to go away. Mm -hmm. I wanted to and really what it was. And this is after lots of, you know, decoding and yes. lots of lots of un unraveling. I understood that I was I was truly just just trying to disappear because I was so, I, I felt so much pressure and I felt like I was disappointing everyone, you know, by not being able to. And, and again, th this all sounds incredibly narcissistic. It was just, not these were, the feeling, these were the feelings that I was feeling at the time that I was like, I just need to go away. And what ended up happening, I've never really talked about this before, but I don't have any shame in talking about it because it is part of mental health. But I ended up getting actually very sick when I was away because I wasn't eating and I wasn't eating because I had to be in a skimpy bathing suit and do a photo shoot. I wasn't eating because I truly wanted to disappear. I wanted to be in control of what was going on in my life at the time. And I went, I'm going to exist on nothing mm -hmm. coming on, coming off of excess as well. I'm going to exist on nothing. And I'm going to, this is what I'm going to choose to do this today. I ended up getting very, very sick, of course. And that's, you know, that's how it goes. Well, and thank you so much for being open about this. I'm in a, I'm in a program for control. You know, it's interesting that we end up in careers that we have zero control over, whether it's a high or a low, we have zero control over that, whether the show hits or it doesn't, whether we get the audition or we don't, whether we are able to make a living at it or we don't, we have zero, zero control in this. I'm so curious. Thank you for being so honest. If you're willing to go there, um, what did you do to then make your nervous system healthy hmm. so you could feel safe? And because you continue to work and to work and to work and you still work. You still show up in all these beautiful on television, on film. I just watched the mental state the other day. And I think you getting so clear in your body or just being aware of what was happening in your body allows you to be of service to some of these great characters. So if you're willing to share with people that are listening and myself, what is your practice to yeah. help navigate I mean, I think that going back to, I think that, I think that I, I feel like I've always been a relatively extra, well, I would say I re I recharge as an introvert. Like I recharge by myself. That's, that's true to this day, but I feel like I never had fear of being extroverted. Mm -hmm growing up and in my youth, I, I developed that fear when all eyes were on me. And then I went, Oh no, 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 too much, too much, too much. So for me, I feel like a lot of it is, is 
a process of, it had to start with, I, I, I'm a big, big believer in therapy. I, everybody has their own methods and means and ways. For me, I felt like, you know, talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy was a very important piece of the puzzle for me because there was a lot that I could not work out by myself. And I tend to overanalyze and, but why, and why, and why, you know, and, and that can, you can drive yourself crazy. If you, if you are not, if you're going over the same things again and again and again, and not having these other little nuggets that can come from having a referee or someone who's just has a bird's eye view. And so I felt like putting myself in therapy, which I did when I was two, I think, Mm -hmm. I think I was 22. I saw someone for a couple years in Vancouver who helped me on so many levels and it wasn't specific. We weren't, we weren't trying to, we weren't trying to understand my feelings about popular. We weren't trying to understand, like it wasn't, it was just in general, what is going on that is creating this anxiety Mm -hmm. and what is going on that is creating these feelings of doubt and where is where does it come from and everything else that opened my eyes to a lot of stuff it also helped me understand that like the relationship i was in was incredibly toxic and it you know it helped me to it helped me to figure out that my reactions and my behaviors were sort of were interlinked with what was going on internally so that was the first foray into learning how to treat myself with kindness and learning how to treat myself with respect. And then, you know, those are lessons I've had to keep learning as well 20 years later. (laughs) And great tools that you're still using too every day. Yeah. And, and, and that is the thing, but I, I think that like, I think that I've found over the years and the different methods like meditation for me is a big one that helps me down regulate my nervous system yes yeah it just it just does and it and sometimes meditating for two minutes for me has more impact than trying to do a 20 minute meditation because if if i get into a 20 minute meditation and then i go oh my brain's moving in other directions. I'm doing this wrong. Oh, I'm, my body's going to be in a state. I'm not going to be able to sleep, like whatever it is, you know, I start winding myself up again. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I find that the actual process of just carving out a very small amount of time can be more giving and more fulfilling and more fruitful than your your nervous system than doing like a task oriented thing. Yeah. I, I love this. So, oh gosh, I love this interview so much. I'm so (laughs) grateful. I'm really curious if you then at this point, because you're helping yourself and you're gaining the tools, do you stay in this beautiful, this is a great strategy. This is a great strategy where William Morris is sending you opportunities and you're like, great. Yeah, no, I'll take this character. Uh, No, I'll take this character because your resume kind of builds itself in that way. And are you at this point, because of popular, able to avoid the audition process because it is so anxiety ridden? So I kind of two questions right there. Like, I mean, I definitely feel like I definitely feel like maybe in the past there were more offers coming in, but that didn't that didn't usurp the necessity of having to audition. I still had to audition. So I feel like auditioning has always been part of it. Part of the lane. Yes. And and even more so, you know, now that you kind of look going, okay, so I've been, I've been working professionally since 1996. So what is that? Like, that's a long, long ass time. time. We're two years from 30. That's incredible. What a, what a, what a career. What but it's well it, thank you it's just so funny because like uh, i can see intellectually that like that's a long time to to have a quote career that is a long time to be doing some career yes and, yeah and to be to be doing something for anything but also to be able to call it a career for that long is incredibly it, it's just it, it really is it's a it's it's truly a gift because i really enjoy it i really love what i do and i really feel like i haven't even 
scratched the surface yet. And popular feels like such a lifetime ago. And that opportunity feels like that was a wave cresting and I jumped off of it. And that's a big regret that I have. That's a really big regret that I have. But I also knew that I had to at the time because I was not as a person well. So I had to take care of myself and I had to figure that out. And yes, it might have compromised the ascension that I could have had in the moment, but at what cost? The cost was already clear to me. So I had to kind of, you know, I had to pull back and I had to sort of go, okay, you know, this is the way it's going to be. But that said, just to go back to like, so I go to Vancouver, I get back to Vancouver and I'm, you know, saying let's do indie stuff or let's do Canadian stuff. Or if it's American, it has to shoot in Canada because I want to be in Canada right now. So I was creating a lot of parameters, which I'm sure were highly annoying to everyone in my life. <laughs> but I was, Doesn't I was, matter. Boundaries yeah. are great. Boundaries are great. And that was also part of control going back to what you know elements of of control doesn't always have to be like contr like controlling certain aspects of your life can have healthful benefits and value and so i felt like that was a way for me to continue working but to feel safe doing so but ultimately what ended up happening for me was i got really frustrated that these indie movies that i was doing in canada were going utterly nowhere like sometimes not even getting into film festivals, or if they were, they're not being seen, they're not being appreciated. I would have these incredible experiences on set where it was so collaborative, the, you know, the ultra, 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 ultra Canadian, ultra low budget. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, Here's yeah, lunch. Like, yeah, there's lunch, maybe. And usually it's because my mom's bringing it. And it's, like, you know, it's uh, which she did on a project in Canada before. But, you know, it, it I just felt like that that sort of undercut the reason why I wanted to do it in the first place. And the reason why I wanted to do it in the first place, this is anecdotal, but my older brother and I, we, we had a lot of immune, we both had a lot of immune stuff going on when we were younger. We had a lot of sick days. He and I would watch a lot of stuff together. We'd watch a lot of programs, you know, it, and because that became something that felt really healing and really good and really safe. And it was really delightful. Mm -hmm. And I remember the, the feeling that you can, I, I, I have remembered this feeling like when you watch an audience, watch something that's delighting them and you are a part of that thing. It's, yeah. It is that is such an unbelievable. We are so lucky to be able to work in entertainment that entertains people. We are so lucky. And I maintain that, you know, there's lots of projects where and you've done them, too. I mean, your work is so you have such a such a beautiful gamut of work mm -hmm. and such a catalog of roles under your belt. And you've gone from having very, very dark material to like the funniest and the lightest. <laughs> and it's, and it's, and, but truly you're, you're such a joy to watch because you do have that, you have that complete, that complete Rolodex within you. And, but I feel like, I feel like we are just so lucky to be able to do what we do and provide entertainment. So when I was doing projects that were going absolutely utterly nowhere, it kind of, I was like, well, what, that's not, that's only part of the thing. Part of the thing, part of the reason why I want to do this is yes, the experiences and just acting is, is a joy and you know, getting paid. But part of it is a service. And part of it is this thing of going like, I want that entertainment to be seen. Yes. Like yes. I want doing something that's going to be seen so that people can go, Oh, that character resonated with me. Or I saw something in that, in that scene or that dynamic, or I saw, you know, I never thought about our relationship that way or whatever, whatever it is. It's like, you know, that's what, that's what these things are. Storytelling is about. Yes. I mean, even watching you in mental state the other day, I was like, wow, so many people get to be seen through this character. So many do. And that's, so then, do you tell, do you call William Morris and you're like, Hey, can you start throwing me those other ones? Like what, how do you step back into, you know, the lane of receiving the responsibility of getting to be a part of things that people are going to see because well, your, you know, resume is just, it they, feels effortless, but <sighs> I'm wondering if that hurdle felt effortful at that time. 
I was going to say, it feels effortless to one of us and it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you for thank you for for seeing it in a way that maybe I am not seeing it. Thank you for that reminder that that's all the two two truths can hold at once, right? Yes, two absolutely. Can be true at the same time, but but yeah. So so with William Morris, I I left LA and said I don't want to work with you anymore, which was insane. Like what an insane thing to do. In, like, totally totally bananas but um that felt right to me at the time because i i felt like i could not give to them what they needed me to give to them which was someone who was willing to do these things that William someone more caa all of these top agencies they're it's a brand it's a business it's about making money absolutely and i wasn't going to make the money at the time because i was like i need to go home i need to yep i need to you know, I need to change the, I need to change my, I just need to change my environment right now. So, so that door was closed a couple of years later when I was in Vancouver, I, my Canadian agent, Time and Stewart said, do you, are you interested in having a manager? I've got some clients with Ben Levine, who was at a company called Evolution at the time. And he said, would, would you like to take a meeting with him? And I met with him and I really liked him. And I thought, okay, you know what? I feel a little stronger. I feel a little better about everything. I feel like I can, the door can, I can crack that door open a little bit to LA again. And that ended up being a really great thing. I'm trying to think off the top of my head, what would have been sort of the first project that I did. That's what I'm looking at, because I mean, you've done 50 plus television shows, but I was wondering where... Cause some stuff is Canadian, like where even yeah, just television, like where you come back in and I can't remember if I did anything around 2004 that in, in the golden, golden age of 2004, where, where I can't remember. The if, collector was the collector yeah, Vancouver. That was Vancouver. Yeah. That was a Canadian. dirt. Dirt was here because I remember I, there. yep. Dirt was a series that I was like, I want to get on this. But that was more like 2006, seven, wasn't it? Yes, that was six, seven. Yeah. So 2004, or five, The Collector. The Mountain was, looks like it was a pilot. That was, that was Vancouver as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah. Um, it feels but, like. So I don't know. So I'm not really sure. It must have been maybe my first job back with Ben as my manager was Dirt, but I feel like there was. I don't know. There was something all around the same time. There was like, there was like dirt. Nemesis game is 2003. So you might've probably done that. Uh, White Shot Coast, that. that's also Canadian. Uh, those are all Canadian. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff in Canada. They would have oh, come. Two out. for the money. I wanted to ask you for yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Two for the money. Cause that's McConaughey and Al Pacino. Yeah. And I was like, there you go, girl. <laughs> but I didn't know if that was also Vancouver. We did shoot that in Vancouver. Yeah. And that was, again, you know, it, like that was the thing I was working on American stuff, but, but really only if it was in Vancouver. And then I moved back down to two that to LA in at the end of 2005, mm -hmm. I had done a TV movie with Bobby Cannavale and yeah. Kristen Moransky called recipe for a perfect Christmas. Mm -hmm. We shot that in Toronto I was getting out of the toxic relationship that I referenced earlier. Yep. And my friend was also getting out of a relationship and she was American and she lived in Vancouver, but she said, I'm thinking I want to move to LA. And because I needed an escape plan myself, I said to her, why don't I go with you? And I'll introduce you to some people that I still know there. I will help you, you know, get on your feet, but I'll just, I'll go with you. So that was like toward, that was like September, 2005. And we ended up coming back to LA. We, we lived in, what was it called? The Oakwood? Oaks. The, the Oak, Oak, Oakwood. 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 Yep. Yeah. So we lived there for like a week. We went to Vegas for a week. We, we st couch, we like couch hopped at people's places. And then we found a, a one bedroom apartment in Los Feliz that we dubbed the dollhouse because it was a tiny little space that she and I lived in together for four, four years. Wow. 
four years, I was still coming back and forth a little bit. Like I was still, I was still doing, I was still had some things going on in Vancouver and I still had an apartment in Vancouver and I still, you know, so I was coming back and forth a little bit, but we cohabitated in that one bedroom apartment for four years in Los Feliz. Um, and, and then that, uh, that trip though, once I kind of got out of what I needed to get out of, and once I made the choice, I actually went from my previous experience of being terrified of everything LA had to offer to really, really excited about it. That's what I was wondering is when that shift came, because then I feel like the work doesn't stop. Well, and, and for a, a minute there, it was pretty good. Like I had a good little run with some things that were going on and it was, it felt really good to be back. I felt inspired, you know, I felt like I was trying to find my footing, but I just felt freer because I had made the decision mm -hmm. and I was making the decision that felt right for me. And I, it felt more aligned, but of course the, the difference is, is the, the wave wasn't cresting though. It was still working. I was in the water. Yes. I was exactly. finding you know, I was in the water and it was good, but it wasn't the same. Like I wasn't coming back at the same point in my career. You know what I mean? But it doesn't that kind of also support your nervous system too. It's like yeah. you're getting to get do great character work. You're getting to bounce around from show to show or jump into a movie over here or a movie over there. The responsibility essentially is not all on you. So you yeah. kind of created the lane in which you can thrive and have it be about the work. Yeah. Yeah. And not have this pressurized spotlight. Yeah. Yeah. It was what a beautiful. Is, yeah. It was a beautiful, a beautiful. Yeah. I have two questions. One, if you don't want to discuss this, we don't have to, but I'd be remiss not to ask this because since this is an audition oh, yeah. podcast <laughs> earlier, when you said David Nutter had me audition yeah, for like the girl who at the beginning was doing the blowjob scene, yeah. doing intimate work like that. And also that was probably in the room. Now people are doing self tapes. Yes. And then he called you back. Yeah. And because everybody on that show was so serious, I want to ask how you handled that kind of material in an audition. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it I remember thinking, I remember thinking this is prohibitively awkward, but also made me feel prohibitively vulnerable. I was, I was 16, I think at the time. Yes. Yeah. You were very, very young, young. Very, very young for, to, to create sexualized content. But that said, and this is not, it's not, it's certainly not an excuse, but our industry was hyper-sexualized with young people. Yes. I mean, it's only recently that there's a reckoning on that, you know, mm -hmm. it's really like, I had one audition for a commercial when I was with a modeling agency when I was 12 and I was supposed to be a 16 year old in a bikini getting splashed by water. Yeah. And they wanted me to, they wanted me to take my top off in the audition to show them like my bra. And I went, I, I, I was 12. I was barely, I was like, oh, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't, I just, I said, no, I was like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not comfortable with that. But anyway, the, the, the point is, is I remember thinking this is such uncomfortable material. And the only reason why it didn't feel horrible is because David Nutter was so sensitive mm -hmm. to the material and he was so caring and kind and gentle and, and not invasive and not, and just, and, and also, I think, also, I think even explained that like for the purpose, because there was a time too, where I think they paired us up with the guys who were auditioning. Oh gosh. Okay. And I think I, and I think I remember him saying, I, well, I do remember him saying, but I'm saying, I think I, I can't remember if this is like before or, at, or during, but it was like, you don't have to touch one another. Like he like made it clear. You do not have to touch one another. This is an audition. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, thank you for saying that because otherwise I don't know, you know, you don't know you your, don't know you, how you handle some of these. Don't know. Yeah. Like that certainly was my first time auditioning sexual material. And sexual material is a hard thing to audition 
period, whether it's a self tape or going in the room, I've had to do some things on couches before where I'm like, how do I handle this material? Logistically, how do I handle this? And people, you know, I coach a bunch of actors and, and we talk about it to create the illusion Yes. Um, create the world that you're still taking responsibility for the story, yep. but having some integrity and some dignity as an actor. That's what I was going to ask you is like, especially because I know that you do coach and you do like, you know, and there's, there's the technique of erase all the bold print, erase right. all the bold print in the script first, and then, you know, figure out what the story is, what the scene is trying to say, and then, you know, sort through there's how, that. yeah. And, but, but that is so curious, like, I think, and I, and thank you for sharing that because I do think that's a beautiful reminder that it's like, have integrity for yourself, the character, the, the material, tell the story without compromising. Yeah. I mean, there's been some auditions for like P Valley, the show that's, I don't know if it's still on the air, but like it's for strippers and a couple of people that I was coaching, they were like, okay, I'm going to send in this tape, but how do I know where this tape goes and how far do I go and how far do I not go? So I just was curious how you handled that because yeah. it is David Nutter and because he's respectable. Yeah. And, um, he was just, he was such a, he was such a gentle, he still, he still is, but like he was just such a gentle person at the time that I remember I never felt like he was, I never felt like he had a, uh, he had an interest in being gratuitous right? about it. The, the script called for what it called for, but I, I just remember feeling like he never, he never had an interest in exploiting anybody, but especially in the audition process, which made it feel ultimately safer. Were you able to avoid the physicality of it completely or did you still physically give the illusion of doing that? That's where no, like, I'm, 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 tangi- I'm looking to, to see if there's like a tangible way for anybody that's listening to know. Yeah, no, that's, it's a really good question. And I wish my memory were stronger because I can't, re- I just, I, I do recall having, I do recall, I, I feel like they did pair us up. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, I feel like they did pair us up with people and I feel like it was kind of one of those things where I just went like what below the frame would be, Great. but it wasn't, but it wasn't like a situation where I was like in his lap or touching Absolutely. him because again, the provision was already there of saying, you don't have to touch one another, not what we're asking you to do. So I think it was that thing of going like, okay, the, and the illusion, it's what you're saying, you know, Mm -hmm. it was the illusion. And, and that was, again, it's, I mean, it's, it's the same. I'm so glad there are intimacy coordinators now because again, I'm getting I just, ready to interview uh, one. I cannot wait. Like there's intimacy coordinators now just for kissing scenes. Any yes. type of intimacy. It's so lovely that we get to be supported in this way now. So we don't, you and I came up in a different era. I mean, this started because I was running in a bikini. Yes. Yeah. But the podcast did. Okay. So I have to ask. Yes. Uh, now, after doing this for as long as you have this beautiful resume and career, when you get an audition now, how do you approach it? <laughs> Other than reading the script, because we all gleam so much from each other. And yes, every audition is different. You, you can take any last couple of years auditions that you have because it's now also self-tape. Yeah, so- yeah. How are you preparing? And you are partnered with an actor. Like, do you guys work together? Yeah. Because yeah. so- well, <laughs> yes, we do work together. In fact, we even work together. Like if we're not physically in the same space, we often will zoom with one another for our auditions, like, or not zoom, FaceTime, like yeah. he'll, you know, and, and Dave is, he's such a, he's such a, a, a wonderful actor, but also he's got such an eye for story. He is truly like a script doctor when it comes to breaking down intention and scene he's really good with story he always has been and it's it's an it's a miraculous quality that he can read something and he can half read something and understand what it is and be able to break it down which is an incredibly like incredibly advantageous characteristic but also as his wife like i feel really nice. grateful for that because i'm like oh my god could you help me with this but so so i would say something that i've more recently gotten back into which is again I I always try to analyze text and break down text and have my own little process with it, but I'm trying to sort of, I've got sort of like 
I've got sort of like the three main things that I do in analyzing texts that have come back and I feel like they really work because it helps to personalize the material. And those three main things are mark marking beats, mm -hmm. like marking beats where the intention changes between one sentence to the other. Yep. And th those won't always stay. You can think a beat is there and then you can discover that it doesn't stay. But that's what I like to do when I first get an audition is like, I'll mark up the beats. Yep. I will, I will mark words that pop out. Like operative words. Yep. Operative words. Yeah. I will mark those words and then I will define those words. And the, that one is the big one. The, the defining of those words, because what ends up happening is you you'll say like let's say i underlined let's say i underlined her or something in a scene and then i go to define what her means and her is a female person or a it i'm that was the wrong word to choose. person appearing female yeah appearing female but it's it could also could be well this this denotes not me. Like this is not me. It's her. It's someone that I am opposite, someone that I am against, someone that I have conflict with. It's someone that I wish to be, it's someone I aspire to be. Or, you know, it's the it's the idea of the idealized her or whatever, like whatever it is. I'm I'm like that's a really shit example. I'm part no, of my, it's a great I, example because sometimes think, operative words people will feel like, you know. The LA Lakers. It's like, how do you feel about the LA Lakers? I love that you're using something like her because yeah. how you lift that gives a lot of point of view. Well, it gives point of view and things like, you know, things like names, like people's names, you know, writers choose names for a reason. And sometimes that can be really indicative of what the character is meant to be or what what a character can experience with that character as a result. So I don't know. I'm finding that like, that's a process that I used to do that I've, I'm bringing back in that I'm really, really appreciating because it's, it's enhancing my experience with the material. Yes. And I feel much more connected to it in an audition, which by the way, is really hard to feel these days when you're doing self tapes and it's really hard to feel connected. Yeah. You're not yeah. getting feedback, you're not getting, you know, you're not getting that immediate sort of gratification of, is it working? Is it not working? Am I on the right track? Do we need to try something else? You know, but are you liking these zoom auditions? Okay. So this is what I'll say is I have had probably, I can probably count on one hand, the amount of zoom auditions I've had since the pandemic, I've probably had five. And every time I get hives basically <laughs> before, before the zoom, because I'm like, Oh God, it's just going to be so awkward. And what if, what if tech goes sour? And what if like, what, if, I don't know, how do you, you know, you can't connect with somebody on screen as well. I mean, we're learning that you can, but it's just not, you don't have the advantage of three, four, five D experience, mm -hmm. right? It's, so I always go in thinking the worst and every single time I've come out feeling more enriched by them. Oh, good. Because, and, and that's, again, that's a very subjective experience. I think because I always feel like they're going to be horrible. I, I tend to find something to glean from them that I wasn't expecting. And I do think the point of connection is a nice thing to be reminded of. I'm glad you said that. I turned down a Zoom this past week because I was just like, as a first call, I'd rather self-tape. As a callback, yeah. I'd love to do a Zoom. Absolutely. I agree with you on that entirely. But an yeah. initial call, it feels when you're going to be getting everybody else's self-tapes that look amazing, that have no glitches, yeah. or no disconnection. Yeah. Um, but it was a point of discussion. And, you know, I also think Dave and I talk about this a lot too, is for, I totally agree because first auditions, I think it's an opportunity for you to take it for a spin. Mm -hmm. So you get to amalgamate it. You get to experience it in your body. You get to like, you get to like settle in with the, with the material. And then if a callback happens, how wonderful you yes. already have muscle memory and the nerves can be used for the adrenaline elsewhere that you need them to be. 
that's that that's that's my new argument moving forward with my team but it was a discussion i like I was, that, though. i like that you stood up for yourself too because it does make sense yeah yeah when it's material that I, if i don't have any questions i think yes. i, I want to give my viewpoint on it i could talk yeah. to you for hours i really i want to say thank you so much because i even just heard you kind of repeat this kind of theme that's happened during this time is that what you are experiencing us as the outside world is experiencing something totally different from your instrument, from your craft, from your career. And to be able to do a deep dive into somebody's process experience and career and have you be as vulnerable as you were, it allows, I think so many working actors or actors that are just starting to make what we do real and the opportunity to be in people's living rooms day in and day out does come with a certain sort of sense of responsibility to be a lead on a show comes with a massive amounts of responsibility so a lot of people including myself when i got here 20 years ago i was like i'm gonna be a lead on the show tomorrow i had no <laughs> idea what that expect and i still have not earned that privilege yet but also now in in desiring that privilege i understand the the responsibility that comes with it and that is only gleamed from being able to talk to people like this is truly a mentorship podcast yeah. that's how i look at it so i really am just from the bottom of my heart as another artist to another it's really really nice to hear people their experience so we don't just project on and then idealize and then set a goal that might not actually be in in alignment with what our instruments want to be used for. Sure. Yeah. And that's, and thank you too. You're such a light Alicia with how you facilitate and, and how you allow these conversations to be had and how you are willing to share so much of yourself and your experience. And, and again, how wonderful you are at accessing the information from all your guests. And it it comes truly from your heart of being so curious and being so willing to go there. And that that's a massive thing. And and I totally I totally concur and celebrate the concept of mentorship because I, I remember a, a dear friend of mine once said, the moment you start teaching is the moment your studenthood begins. And that's not you know, that is not a revelatory concept, but it's so true if you allow it to be such. Like, even if you are in a place of teaching, power, position, rank, there's still so much more to learn. There's still so much more to discover. So, well, And there's just so much I realized I don't know. You realize you're like, oh, wait a second. I haven't experienced this or wait. Yeah. It, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for reflecting that. I really do appreciate you. Um where can everybody find you follow along and what can they watch right now? People can find me very seldom and poorly on social media. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love um, following you on social though. You're so great. You're so funny on it. Um, Twitter and I'm not really using or X or whatever we're saying. I, I'm not really using that platform anymore, but I still check in and I still find it, but Pope underscore on a rope, one word. And then same with Instagram is also that handle. Those are kind of the two social media areas. Mental State is out. It's available to rent on, on all the platforms, Apple, all Amazon. Platforms. Yeah, I watched it. And, and then hopefully Pretty Little Liars season two comes out at some point soon. And there's a couple episodes in there. And that's about it. That's about it. That's all she wrote for now. For now. For now. For now. <laughs>